How many of you were here yesterday? Okay, only a few. How many of you will be here tomorrow? Ah, oh, good. All right, good. Uh, for those of you who this, this is your only day, it's, it's the last session of the day. Some of you are tired, but it's only one day of conference. It's not like, you know, the two or three day things where by the end you just feel like you can't learn anything else. So no excuses. You've only been here one or two days. You can still learn things, even though it's late in the day. Um, this talk is about Gaelic. And uh, Gaelic is, is a pretty interesting thing. Let me tell you a little bit about it. How many people in here, if I may ask, have used Groovy, the language? Okay, one hand proudly held high, and a few hands, good. All right, how many in here would identify yourselves as Java developers? So the bulk of you, good, good, good. Uh, Groovy, for those of you who don't use it or don't know, is a language that runs on the JVM. It compiles down to Java bytecode, just like Java does, uh, except it's got a bunch of features that make it, I think, a better language for writing application code, web application code. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, things like declaring collection literals and using closures and iterating over collections, all these kinds of things that are a little bit of a pain in Java. And, you know, you show your Java code to maybe your friend who writes in Ruby or something like that. They kind of make fun of you a little bit. That hurts. You know, I don't like that. Uh, Groovy is a great language for that, great language for application development. And let's talk about the way we as Java people deploy applications. And I can say we because pretty much everybody put their hand up when I asked if you're a Java developer. And we've got a nice deployment story, right? If you make a Java web app, you build a war file and you throw it into Tomcat or Jetty or whatever it is you like to do. Or if you work for a big organization, you hand it to an operations team and they're going to take that and deploy it in whatever container that they use. It's very easy to work with, right? So in an enterprise context, that's a strong story. I like it. But it's not always so strong. Now, let's talk about a related technology. That's Grails. And in my introduction, uh, the, the text talks about Grails a little bit. I'm a Grails developer and trainer. I love Grails. Who has used Grails here? Anybody? Awesome. Look at these hands. The same people who use Groovy. Big surprise, right? Okay, so you go download Grails. Grails is a web application framework for the JVM. Um, you go download it, and you create a new application. You add no code of your own, no code at all, and then you just use this, this bare Grails app, and you build a war file. That war file is about 20 megabytes, just with an empty application. Now, again, if you work for a big organization, that's not a problem. The operations guys, they're not going to care if it's 20 or 40 or 60. You know, who really cares? But what kind of a deployment story is that? Now, go talk to your PHP friends, and you say, oh, a, bear, a, a, a totally naked, empty application? That's a 20 megabyte upload. They're going to laugh at you. Okay, they're going to, as I say, they're going to kick sand in your face and, and beat you up, because it's not a very good deployment story. I would like a better deployment story for small applications. And uh, real quick, do I sound loud? I sound very loud to me. Is there, do I sound okay to everybody? Yes? A little? Perfect? Okay, I'll just deal with it. Good. The third thing I want is I don't want any more big web app frameworks. Okay, look, this is the Java world. It, it's nice in the .NET world. They have, like, one way to do it. And it's whatever Microsoft says, they, they do that. And it's very easy. But for us, we have dozens of frameworks to choose from. And a half a dozen big, big choices, right? Why do we do this? So I, I just would like to stop the madness. I don't want another big framework. If we're going to have another framework, I'd like it to be easy. And that's really what Gaelic is. It's a Groovy-based, very lightweight web application framework with, that, that deploys to the Google App Engine. So the deployment story is very strong. We get simple push-button deployments. You don't have to think about hosting. Often you don't even have to pay for hosting. In the simple case, it's free. So this is a lot of interesting things for us as Java developers. Who here, another interview question, who has used the Google App Engine? Oh, wow, a bunch of you. Okay. So uh, those of you uh, who have, uh, you're going to learn about it again for about 10 minutes. Those of you who haven't, I'm going to give you a very quick overview. Because to understand Gaelic, you have to understand the App Engine. Because all of its services are services of the App Engine itself. So the Google App Engine is fundamentally an application server, and it's in the cloud. It's not something you buy and install on hardware of your own. It's something that you access through a web browser at some URL that exists off in the cloud. It's Google's way of exposing their application infrastructure to us, one, one application at a time. 
runs on their infrastructure. It is usually free. To get started tonight, you can go home, you can download Gaelic, you can build your first application, you can register an application on the App Engine, deploy, and pay nothing. And it won't even take you long. It'll probably take you 15 minutes to do your first one. Everything you do in the App Engine is, me is measured. There's a meter running. Every web request you make, every bit of data you store, every, every file you transfer back to the browser, back, back to the, the client, all of that stuff is measured. And there's a certain quota of activity that you can have that's free. And these are probably actually slightly out of date numbers. I'm sorry about that. This number up here that says 1.3 million requests free, it turns out that's actually 43 million requests free right now. So Google is constantly increasing these numbers. Uh, I heard an interview with one of the App Engine architects a few months ago, and he sort of like, felt guilty that they had limits. So we, we don't want to have limits. We're trying to get past all those. But you have these very generous quotas uh, that are free, up to six and a half CPU hours of computation time for computing, for running all of your request handling code. And you think, well, wait, you're not really used to thinking about your requests in terms of how many CPU seconds they take, right? There's actually a log in the App Engine management interface where you can look for every request you run. It'll tell you how many CPU milliseconds or CPU seconds it took. Uh, kind of nice. You can kind of get to, uh, start to get a feel for that. Six and a half hours, pretty generous for free. If you exceed those, it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, it's, it's pretty generous. Bandwidth is about 10 cents US uh, per gigabyte. CPU time is 10 cents US per hour. So if you run over a little bit, it's not going to hurt much. And of course, all totally configurable. You don't need to worry about somebody executing a distributed denial service attack on your credit card. Uh, you know, if if your, your application does get a lot of traffic, you set how much you want to spend, after which your application stops responding. We all remember about four years ago, th three years ago, the Google App Engine was launched with the language Python. And all the Java people in the world said, what? Python? Yeah. Uh, it was launched with Python, I imagine, because the engineers inside Google that, that came up with the idea and produced it were Python developers. A year later, it was launched with Java support, which was much more exciting to us because now it was a thing we could use. And of course, if it has Java support, it has support for the languages of the JVM. And that's really what gets me excited is not Java code itself, but what can I do in these other languages like Scala and Clojure and Groovy. Most of the code I write for my clients, I write in Groovy. So this is exciting to me that it supports Groovy. It is an app server, but it does a few other things, and those things are fairly impressive. Let me just go through that list quickly. There is a database behind the App Engine. It's not a relational database. Some people, if you follow the App Engine closely, may know that Google is talking about releasing a relational database-like feature there, but the data store that's a part of the App Engine by default is a non-relational database, uh, but we can use it to store application data. It does authentication. I can log into Google. My Groovy or my App Engine applications can, can see if I'm logged in and find out what my name is. There's a caching layer. Instant messaging. Email, of course, you can send and receive email. There's a task queue. So the App Engine is very request-centric. The basic unit of work is a web request. So if someone clicks on a URL, the browser issues a get to that URL. Somebody posts a form, issues a post to some URL. You process that unit of work as a request. If there's work you want to queue up, say someone uploads a big file, a CSV file, and you need to iterate through it and do some sort of work on each row in that file, you can queue those through the task queue and have those execute in the background. There's an image API. When I first saw that, I wanted to scratch my head. I'm like, why is there an image API? That doesn't really seem like it fits in with these other things, but it'll make sense in a minute. Uh, URL fetching, okay, fine. OAuth, there's OAuth support. There's a blob store for data that's too big to fit into the data store. You can, you can put uh, big, giant chunks of data in the blob store through a RESTful interface. There are a few limitations. For example, uh, in, in the Java version of the App Engine, there are some classes that you can't load. They don't exist in the version of Java uh, that you're running. And Google refers to this list of classes you can't have as the whitelist, which is kind of a nice way to put a positive spin on a negative thing. You know, we, you can't have these things, and that's called the whitelist. So they even document it that way. They show you a list of the classes you can load. So they're trying to be very positive here. Uh, but basically, you can't have AWT, you can't have Java X image, 
Uh, you can't have Java Lang thread. You can't directly do file I.O. Plenty of limitations like that. Uh, some of that makes sense. You don't, you know, they, they're, they're trying to provide this very scalable, very low cost way of exposing their infrastructure, and they can't really have you uh, spinning off all these threads and, and tying up their CPUs doing all kinds of interesting computation. So they're trying to provide their infrastructure in a way that's safe for them and still useful for us. No Hibernate support. Remember I said there's this data store that's non-relational? Well, they provide implementations of the JPA and JDO interfaces that will let you access the data store as if it were relational. So they're kind of whispering sweet little lies in your ears, like, yeah, it's okay, it's a relational database. Works just like JPA. And so you can annotate classes with the JPA annotations and have them persisted to the data store. And, and that works great. No implementations of Hibernate interfaces, which means uh, Grails is traditionally a little bit hard to make work. Because Grails traditionally wants uh, Hibernate as its persistence layer. Now I know there's now the Grails JPA plugin, and people have had more success deploying Grails applications to the App Engine. And if you are a Grails developer, you may already know that there is an App Engine plugin to help solve some of those problems and help you deploy your application to the App Engine. But it's not a good fit for reasons that we'll see. It can be done, and if you're doing it and it works for you, that's a good thing. Many people have had trouble doing that, and that's one of the reasons that Gaelic exists. Uh, there is controversy over how well Java performs on the App Engine. This mostly centers around the cold start problem. If you have an application that doesn't get a lot of traffic, maybe only gets hit every five or ten minutes, uh, and I, I don't really know, nobody really knows what that length of time is, but there's some length of time after which your JVM sort of gets swapped out, and it's not live on the server anymore. So the next request to your, your URL has to swap you back in, and it could take two, three, four. Some people have said they've seen 30 seconds for the cold start. I have never seen it take that long, but this is a known performance issue for lightly trafficked apps. So, and, and in a way, I've seen people complain very loudly about this online. They say, oh, it's just terrible. It takes so long to cold start, which is like saying, my application doesn't get any traffic. I don't want to tell the world that. <laughs> If, if the application is well trafficked and gets some attention, then um, it's not a thing you're going to need to worry about. So that's your lightning fast overview of the App Engine. Now let me tell you about Gaelic. Gaelic is Groovy based. We know that. Groovy is the language that we would love to use for web applications. It is very lightweight. In fact, if you, I encourage you, you like what you hear here today, I encourage you to go download not just Gaelic, not just the project template. I'm going to do some coding. I'm going to show you how to start up a project. Download the source code for Gaelic. And look at how simple it is. It's very, very lightweight. Because all of the heavy lifting, all of the services, is just done by the App Engine. Gaelic is just trying to kind of wrap that for you. So very lightweight framework. It is page-centric. It's not a component framework. It's page-centric. And it is tightly coupled to the App Engine. So here's one thing you're not going to do. You're not going to go create an app in Gaelic and deploy it to the App Engine, maybe trying out some business idea or something. And then if that business is successful, the application gets very popular, you say, I don't want to be on the App Engine anymore. I want to go run on my own server. Let me just migrate my Gaelic application to that server. You can't do that. Gaelic is permanently coupled to the App Engine. So what you'd have to do is rewrite that application for the new platform. Now, that might seem like a bad thing, but I would suggest to you, say you do that. Say you have some business idea. And you want a cheap way to get started. You spend no money, just go write the thing, get it hosted, get it up there, get it running quickly, and it becomes very successful. So much that it's becoming expensive for you to pay the hosting fees on App Engine, and you want to go get a server co-located somewhere. You're probably going to have to rebuild that app at that point anyway. If the business has grown, it's going to have changed at scale. Things are going to work differently. You probably would have wanted to do that rewriting anyway. Uh, so that's, I don't think, as big a problem as it seems. Usually Gaelic is trying to serve the small app and it does a very good job at that. Ultimately, what it wants to be is a groovy way to use the Java APIs, the Java version of the App Engine. If you're a groovy guy like I am, after a while, Java code feels painful. I'm sorry. I know many of you are using Java, and you're not using groovy, and I'm probably insulting you right now, but it makes me so mad when I have to write Java code. It feels like I just have to say 
a thousand words to say hello. And, and, and it's not that bad. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But the, the Java Google App Engine APIs are the same way. They're very wordy, very pedantic, make you take all these steps. The, uh, Gaelic wants to wrap that using groovy idioms. Well, um, what should we do? We can, make a, we can kind of make a decision at this point. I get some input from you. I could show you slides of code and talk through them and point at them. I have a laser. I can point at them with my laser. Or I can just write some code. Would you like me to write some code? Is it more fun? Yes? Why does everybody like to see me write code? Okay. You're just hoping you're going to get to watch, make, watch me use the backspace key. All right. Let's do this. Could I get somebody in the back to tell me about the font size? Good? A little more? A little smaller, you said? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. How's that? Good. Okay. Um, it's okay. I'm getting older, too. Sometimes I have to use a, a bigger font size than I'd like. All right. Now, this is, this is pretty tough stuff, so pay attention. You want to build a Gaelic application. What you do is you go to gaelic.appspot.com. You click on Downloads. There's a zip file. You download that zip file. That's step one. Okay, step two is you unzip that zip file into a directory, and I'm going to call that directory GIDS. And uh, step three actually is not a step three. I have created a Gaelic application just like that. It's awesome. Now, the hidden step, just like on a cooking show, you know, you watch a cooking show where they're, they're showing you how to make recipes, and they say, here are these steps, it's so easy, and here's this other step, oh, I'll pull this thing out of the oven, that's totally done. The one step I didn't show you is installing the App Engine SDK. So that's not difficult, you go to Google, and you Google, Google App Engine SDK Java, and download that and install it, and it's in your path. So I'm going to use some commands on the command line that are from the App Engine SDK, but don't worry about them. That's already there. We now have prepared this project, and so I'm going to run dev app server, point it to the war directory, and it's going to scroll some very important logging. And we'll be patient while it starts up. Hmm. Well, that's unexpected. Maybe you don't want to watch me code. Look at that. It just kicked out. Let me try another project here. Um, hmm. All right, give me just a second here. I did test this mere minutes before I came in here because I wanted to make sure it worked well. Okay, so I won't be able to show you that just yet. Let me take you through some code so that we've got something to look at together, and we'll try that again in a little bit. Let me show you the structure of uh, an app engine, I'm sorry, a Gaelic project. Remember, I just unzipped the zip file, and that really is the only installation step. Everything you need is in there, all the jar files you need are in there, and a template for the project is, is all included. So let me walk you through the pieces. There's a directory called source that doesn't have anything in it. We're not going to, well, there's one file in it. has no source in there, uh, just one metadata file. And then a directory called war, which looks like the structure of a war file. So everything you would expect to see, maybe even your, your project structure has a directory called war where you put all those things. So we'll see things like static resources, like CSS can go in there, images, JavaScript, uh, you know, basically the things that, that you would expect to be present in a war file. And then there are two other important kinds of files for a Gaelic application. There are templates and there are groovelets. Templates are like view files. They're sort of like HTML. They're going to describe the actual layout of a web page. Groovelets are code where we process requests. So let's have a look inside. Good in the back? All right inside a GTPL file. Stare at that for a second, and you realize you were looking at HTML. It just looks like HTML. There's not much 
to it. And then you start to look a little more closely, and you see up here, there's this thing, this angle bracket percent. What is that? Think back to before you had Spring MVC and before you had struts in the dark days of 2000, 2001, when you wrote JSPs with scriptlets in them. Why is this man on stage asking you to write scriptlets again? I'm not going to tell you yet. Uh, but I, I want to point out, that's a scriptlet. Before, you had Grails, which uses uh, site mesh for its templating. Or Tiles is another great page decoration framework. Before you did that, you used JSP Includes to say, you know, I want this common header, and here is this particular page doing this part of the UI. I'll just include the header. That was kind of how we did that in those bad old days, and we're doing it again. That's exactly what's happening here. This is including a header file, and it's down under WebInf, so nobody can go directly load header.gtpl, but the framework can, and we go in here, and very simply, that's the top part of the page. It's got the HTML opening tag, the head, and some navigation links, and the logo, and all that stuff that you want to be on every page. So we're going to reset the clock and go back to those bad old practices. I gave this talk once in New York City. And uh, if, if you've never been to the US, um, developers in the US normally dress pretty casually. Okay, Like the clothing I'm wearing right now is a little too nice. Like, like slacks. Uh, most developers are going to look at me like, what, why are you wearing slacks? Do you have to go to an interview or something? You know, and the collar, really. I mean, do you have a t-shirt? Laundry day? So this is like a little suspicious. So imagine a developer wearing a tie. Okay, that's, that's like, you must be stupid. I mean, that's really what that means, is if, if you're wearing a tie and a suit, that means you're just not good at writing software. So I, I was giving this talk to, to uh, this, this user group, the Java user group in New York City. Okay, I'm from Denver, which the, the city, it's, you know, one or two million, three million people in the area. Plenty of technology going on, but it, it never makes the top 10 or even top 20 lists of technology cities in the U.S. I always feel sad because it gets left out. I love it. It's a beautiful place. But, and, and there's technology there, but it's, nobody thinks of it when they think of technology in the U.S. New York City. Okay, the New York City Java user group. These are the financial companies that, that control the universe here. And there, there, were, there were literally two men wearing suits. These are developers wearing suits. I just didn't know what to make of this. And I'm giving this talk on Gaelic. And these are guys who, who write big, giant enterprise applications. And I'm telling them, hey, use scriptlets. And about three quarters of the way through the talk, they said, what are you trying to do to us? Why are you making us use scriptlets? And I made them wait, and I'm going to make you wait too. Uh, but there's a lot of great lessons here in, in the fact that I'm asking you uh, to take a step back. So let me walk you through a few more things here. Very simply, in the index template, there's a link here uh, that says, you can see, click here to view the current date time, right? And all the link is, is to a URL called datetime.groovy. Now, GTPL files, by default, go at the top of, and you don't care who's signing on my Skype account, so I'll close that. Um, GTPL files, by default, go at the top of the war directory. And I can access them directly. I could say localhost, colon 8080, slash index at GTPL, and that file is going to be loaded. Uh, groovy fi dot groovy files, by default, go under webinf, groovy, and here. And what that is, is a little groovy script that responds to that request. So when somebody clicks on that link, that's going to go load datetime dot groovy. And it's not passing in any parameters, so that's pretty simple. There's nothing that really has to happen. But this code executes. Now, for those of you who put your hands up when I asked for Java developers, but didn't put your hands up when I asked for Groovy developers, who has never really seriously looked at Groovy code? Don't be embarrassed, because I'm going to call on you if you don't put your hand up. OK, good. All right, so there's a number of you who haven't. So this might not look anything like Java to you. A few quick tips about Groovy. Number one, this business here. This is a method call. In Java, you would do that. It's the same thing. You just don't have to put the parentheses. And same thing here. 
the semicolon is option, optional. Notice single quotes. Well, that's the same thing, sort of. The groovy people are saying, no, it's not. But basically, single quotes are going to do the same thing as double quotes. It's another way of representing a string in Groovy. So this code is not quite as foreign as it looks. And you can see it's doing some logging. Ah. And really, if we took that logging out and compressed this a little bit, this is doing two things. It's creating a new date, converting it to a string, and stuffing it into the request scope using the set attribute method. Then it's forwarding the request to a template. So when you're processing a groovelet in Gaelic, there are two things you can do with it. You can send it on uh, to a view or to a template with the forward method. Or I could also decide to redirect. Like that. So those, those, that's the, the most basic kind of request you can possibly process, passing an attribute back into the template. Now let's go see in the template and see what happens in there, how we can, can't find it, so I'll have my editor find it, what we do with that parameter that we pass back to the GTPL template. So again, looks like some fairly understandable HTML, uh, the, the includes of the header and the footer, and in here, another scriptlet that's just demonstrating some logging. That doesn't really add any value, so I'm going to clip that out so you don't have to think about it. But to get at the date time, we use that familiar scriptlet mechanism. Familiar if you were writing web apps in 2001 uh, to pull that back out of the request scope. So pretty simple, isn't it? Very simple. Now, let's imagine we wanted to use one of the other services in the app engine, right? So we're not really using any app engine services here. We're just kind of responding to requests. Let's look at our mobile phones. And now let me show you some slides to kind of give you an idea of, of what it looks like to use app engine services. And I'm going to compare them to the Java versions of those APIs. Just a minute, I'm going to get you to the right place since we are doing things out of order. All right. If you're using the, the Java API in the Google App Engine to send email, that hurts because you have to use the Java API for sending mail. You have to use javax.mail, and you have to write a lot of code. I mean, look at this. That's, that's pretty wordy. It's pretty wordy. It's like a bad novel. It takes too many words to say not enough. Here's how you do it in Gaelic. Much, much more simple. And this mail object right here, if I were writing a groovelet, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to import anything. I don't have to call a factory method to get an instance of that. I don't have to wire up dependency injection. It's just there. All of those things are injected. So all of these objects I'm going to show you that, that are the wrappers for the App Engine services are automatically injected into scriptlets, or group, pardon me, groovelets and templates. I just get to use them by default. So memcache, the, the, the caching layer in the App Engine is, they call it memcached. So how hard can that be? It's just a key value store, right? How can I make that so wordy? Really, this line of code right here, and see, I, I have to make this small so it'll all fit on the page. You guys in the back can't even see this. It's so small. But it's just a key value, put, is really all I want to do. But I have to import and do all this cache manager dot get instance dot get cache factory dot create cache collections dot empty map. And you know what Ruby people will do to you if you show them code like that. They will make fun of you and you will deserve it. This is how you do it in Gaelic. In Groovy, that is map syntax. So if you had a hash map or just an instance of the map interface, Instead of calling get and passing the key, you can just reference it with square brackets like that. And if you want to write to a map, instead of calling put, um, oh, pardon me, that's a get there, and this is a put. I just assign a variable or a value 
to the cache, square brackets, the key. Really beautiful stuff. And Gaelic is taking that groovy idiom and putting it on top of the app engine. URL fetch. Again, we're just trying to get something off the web. That's all this is. It's an app engine service. I have to catch exceptions. Aha! Checked exceptions. Make it stop. This is all I have to do in Gaelic. Just two lines of code. Very, very simple. And really, frankly, the fetch is just one. This is to pull content out of the fetch and do something useful with it. The task queue. Same kind of thing. A very simple API. Okay. And let's talk about task queues a little bit. Again, these are timed HTTP requests. So I've got some work that I've collected in one web request, and I want that to process in the background. A good example would be if I upload a file that's got a list of images, and I want to go pull those images off the web. It's a list of URLs. I want to pull them off the web, do some kind of image processing work on them, which could be expensive, and then store them in the blob store to retrieve them later. So you're writing some kind of image processing application in Gaelic. You could certainly do that, uh, but you'd want, to, you'd want to do that with a task queue. Uh, there's a, a file in the webinf directory called queue.xml uh, where I'm going to configure those task queues, documented there. And the nice thing about task queue code is that you can update it without pushing a new release of your web application. Instant messaging. Let's talk about this. This is a great thing if you want your application to be able to notify your users of something, have a little IM pop up, uh, or have a conversation with your users. You can use it for inter-process communication and use a nice groovy API. You can also receive messages with a servlet. So let me show you. This is the horrible, horrible Java code, the villain that everyone should boo, right? No, okay. Um, and this is what it looks like in Groovy. So a heck of a lot simpler. It's really just down to the essence of what you're trying to get done. I was, uh, I was, one, I was kind of talking once. Uh, I gave this talk to an audience that uh, you know, I was just thinking with them, what would you use IM for? Why would you want an application to support instant messaging? And I thought, hey, you know, you could make a Gaelic version of Eliza. Who knows what Eliza is? Have you heard of that? Okay. It's, if you haven't heard of it, it's a very old program. It's like a 40-year-old program. An early artificial intelligence researcher wanted to write this program that acted like a psychotherapist. So it would, it, you would run Eliza, and Eliza would say, tell me about your problems. And you'd say, well, I'm sad. And it would say, why are you sad? You'd say, well, because my girlfriend broke up with me today. Uh, and it'll say, oh, you say your girlfriend broke up with you today? And then you'll go on talking like this. This is an actual model of psychotherapy where the therapist just kind of goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, and doesn't really say much and gets you to talk. So Eliza is this very primitive AI program, and it's, it's pretty goofy. If you go find a version of it online, it, it, it isn't really all that sophisticated. But it turns out there's a Java version of Eliza. So I was just thinking aloud, and I said, hey, you could write Eliza with Gaelic by importing that jar, putting it in your project, and then using the IM interface to pass messages to the Eliza API and return them uh, through IM. And so if you go to your Gmail account and add a friend called Gaelicaiza, G-A-E-L-I, G-A-E, Gaelic, yeah, G-A-E-L-Y-K-I-Z-A at appspot.com. That's this person's email address. You'll always have this little green dot on your Gmail page, this friendly voice that you can click on and, and chat with. Uh, I didn't write this. Uh, there was somebody in the audience who had never used Gaelic before, uh, and, and after the talk, he went up to his hotel room, and about 45 minutes later, I saw this tweet tweeting you know, to the link to the thing. Hey, I wrote this in Gaelic. And that's how easy this thing is. He, he, he got all that done, integrated Eliza that quickly. It was really neat. Using the IM interface. There's also, he gave it a really simple web interface, but you don't need that. OK, if you want the application to process emails, you can do that. This is an App Engine feature. Therefore, it's a Gaelic feature. There's a built-in servlet that comes with Gaelic to process these. And you have to enable it in two separate files, App Engine Web XML and Web XML. You have to uncomment the servlet definition. And then you get a groovelet under the webinf groovy directory. You make a groovelet called email.groovy. And it has a variable in it every time it runs called message. Message has to, from, body, attachments, and so forth. So every time your application gets an email, that groovelet runs. You can process it. Pretty cool stuff. Same thing with inbound messaging. And this is the way Gaelic Isa works. It uses the XMPP servlet 
called jabber.groovy and the message variable. It's on GitHub. I encourage you to go look for that, and, and you can look at that code, see how it's done. Gaelic has a plugin framework. They are very much like Grails plugins. Now, most of you are not Grails developers. So that doesn't tell you much. But a Grails plugin is basically a mini Grails application. It's kind of cool. So anything that a Grails application can have, a Grails plugin can have. Similarly, anything a Gaelic application can have, a Gaelic plugin can have. Uh, there is, in addition to all of the, the content of the plugin, a file called plugin descriptor.groovy that describes the plugin and lets you change the structure of Gaelic itself. I'll give you a few details in just a minute. These are bundled as zip files, and there is currently uh, there is no central site to go to. For Grails plugins, you go to grails.org slash plugins. And there's this great catalog. You can search. There's ratings. Everything's great. If you want to install a plugin, there's a command. You say Grails install plugin, and you give the name of the plugin. It's all integrated. Gaelic is not. Gaelic wants to be very lightweight. So how do you learn about Gaelic plugins? Well, you go look for them. You read about them in a blog post. Somebody tweets about one. The, dis the discovery mechanism is ad hoc. And the installation mechanism is simply unzip it on top of your project. Very easy stuff. So remember I said they can do anything a Gaelic app can do, a plugin can do. So see how limited this framework is. There's, I've said nothing about security. I've showed you all these these scriptlet things that you don't like doing. You might want to improve those. So anything a Gaelic app can do, I can, I can add into a Gaelic plugin. I can provide extra groovelets and extra templates by default. Custom routes. Suppose you don't want your URL, and we couldn't get things running. There's a little problem there, so I couldn't show you. But you would see URLs like, like you know, your hostname slash datetime.groovy. Now, personally, I don't like to expose implementation technologies in my URLs. I think that's very bad form. I would rather have that be slash date time. So there's a file in here uh, called routes.xml where I can go to specify that. I can also put custom routes in my plugins. Arbitrary jars. So if I wanted to make Gaelic a plugin, I could include the Gaelic jar in that plugin. I'm sorry, uh, Eliza. I could include the Eliza jar in the plugin, and that just gets installed with your jars and your project. Here's what's important. Inside the plugin descriptor.groovy file, I can make arbitrary changes to the framework by binding new variables into groovelets and templates. Remember how to send mail? We just had that mail variable that just showed up and worked. It was an instance of something. If you want to create some other service or some other abstraction on top of other App Engine services, simply create those objects in the plugin and bind them into the groovelets and the templates with a variable that you choose. So. This is another way, potentially, to address the simplicity of the framework. If you don't like lots of scriptlets, and you wish you had a way to write custom tags like you can in Grails, it's so easy. Well, you could write a plugin that creates a new variable inside of, script, inside of, of templates that would work sort of the same way. You have a whole lot of power to make the framework anything you want to be. And of course, it also has a section where you can perform some initialization code. There's a very little known Groovy feature called Groovy Categories. And again, I encourage you to download the code for Gaelic and look into it. It makes heavy use of this feature. Very few Groovy programs, very few Groovy developers use categories. But Gaelic was written by one of the authors of the Groovy language, so it would figure that he would use whatever features he wanted. He knows them all. Uh, so it uses categories to enhance any other class. So say there's a class like String in just Java Lang String. You can't extend string. You can't make changes to string. Using Groovy and Groovy's metaprogramming, you can make string look like it has methods that it doesn't really have. So the string class that people use inside your Gaelic app might have a method called shout that converts everything to uppercase or something like that. You can add your own methods using categories. Uh, a few examples of plugins in the wild. There's one called Objectify. Uh, there's one for, uh, for Granite DS, the, the Flash front end thing. Now, since this whole thing runs in the cloud, you don't want to have to deploy your application to the cloud to see how it works. The App Engine SDK gives you a pretty good uh, uh, 
pretty good simulation of things uh, locally. So you can, you can make all that run locally. The data store is simulated. Authentication is simulated. Uh, much of what you need to do uh, runs for you. So let me make a quick change here and just see where I am. Right, so you get uh, pretty good emulation. All right, we've got a few minutes left. So I want to I answer for the scriptlets and all of the ugliness that Gaelic is asking you to do. Because these guys in New York, they got a little mad at me uh, that, that I was asking them to do all these bad things, right? And I said, well, you picked the talk. <laughs> really, You had a list, and you wanted to hear about Gaelic. So. But they, they, were, they were just not sure what this is all about. And here's what I said. Have as a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's very true, all right? And it's, much, it's just as true about our software tools. So think for a minute about the kinds of tools that Java people use to build web applications, the frameworks that we have. And I'll pick on two of them. I'll say Spring MVC and Struts. So those are, those are going to cover historically a lot of the web applications that get built in Java. What do we know about those frameworks? Well, I find them to be very responsible and structured, and they make good use of design patterns like MVC. Okay, I couldn't say this yesterday in the .NET version of the conference because I'd get in trouble, but Microsoft people are very excited about this new thing that, that Microsoft has just released called MVC uh, that, that apparently is an idea that they came up with in, in Washington, in Redmond. Um, and they're saying, wow, this is great. It's a great way to build apps. And you know, Java people are kind of like, yeah, that was cool eight years ago. Okay? We've been doing that. But think about it. It's a great design pattern. And our frameworks are structured around this MVC framework. And you know, they're, 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 they're good object-oriented frameworks where if I want to refactor uh, something about the way a particular request is handled, I can even use my IDE's refactoring tools to change things in my application because the code's not all scattered around through scriptlets and everything. It's, it's well done. So these frameworks are designed for applications that are going to get complex and are going to have lots of people collaborating on using them. And they do that well. And we can't go back for applications like that to the way we used to do it. Those tools don't work anymore. But what's the cost of that? That's the, that's the tool we have. Those are the kinds of tools we have. They've built up to service the kind of applications we build. But then I look at the kinds of things that PHP people do. And I'll think, OK, there's like some uh, big event that makes big news, maybe a, a big political scandal or something. And four hours later, after the scandal breaks, somebody's registered a domain name. And there's a site up at that domain name doing something. It's not just static content. It's some kind of interactive site. Somebody wrote code in four hours and, and deployed this site. I guarantee you that was not done with Java. Ask yourself, as a Java web developer, can you even think of doing that in four hours? It, you, just, you wouldn't even bother. The idea wouldn't enter your mind because the tools we have are shaped to solve different kinds of problems. What that does is it means we're really good at complex stuff and really simple stuff it takes us too long to get started to even think about the simple stuff, so we never do it. Even if it's a great framework like Grails that's super high productivity and super fast, it's still a big enough framework. It's still, it's still a 20 megabyte file to do nothing. And maybe you've got a fast connection and it doesn't take you long to upgrade but, or upload, but there's just kind of an inertia to that inherently in the structure of that tool. So I think what Gaelic is trying to do is say, we need something simple, push-button deployment, goes to the app engine, it's free to host, I don't have to think about it. I, I start a project by unzipping a file, I edit a few files, I go refresh my browser with the local development environment, everything works, I press the button, it deploys. I can do that four-hour application. Heck, I can do a one-hour application now. My friend who wrote the Eliza thing did it in 45 minutes. He knew Groovy, but all he knew about Gaelic was what I told him in the space of an hour and a half. It was a longer version of the same talk. So it's the kind of tool that lets us serve that very low end. So it's sort of the sensibilities of the PHP developer, but the JVM, Java lang libraries, a language like Groovy that you want to use. So I think this is really, really a powerful idea. And I encourage you, as you're thinking about it, to think about this idea of tools and the shape of your tools and how that influences your work 
and the way you solve problems and the problems you think about pos as possible problems to solve, uh, Gaelic asks us to go back to some bad things. But it has to. If you tried to fix it, if you tried to add a tag library, tag library system and some nice templating system and, and some uh, way of, of subclassing actions and, and things like that, the more you add, the less it is what it's going to be. If you turn it into Grails, you broke it. It's got to stay primitive and simple to solve those problems that it solves. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be hanging around for a little bit. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being here. Would we have any more questions? Can you please suggest some resources for Gaelic mm. in a book? You'd like to there is no book. There is excellent documentation at gaelic.appspot.com. There's a link called Tutorial, and everything you need to know is there. Uh, I, I will also be doing a workshop based on Gaelic on Friday, where I think there will be some people who weren't here there, so I'm going to repeat some of this material. If you have a laptop, if you want to code along with me, please come to that. We'll build an application. It will actually run, unlike what you saw here. Um, I'll get that cleared up. But gaelic.appspot.com, tutorial, everything you need to know. Uh, gaelic.appspot, A-P-P-S-P-O-T. Sorry, I was saying that quickly. Appspot.com is the root domain name of any app engine application. So G-A-E-L-Y-K dot A-P-P-S-P-O-T dot com. Anybody else? Uh, hey, Tim, I have a question. I have been building applications on Grails framework for quite a long time, uh, close to a year. But still, I have uh, some kind of misconceptions regarding the produ production, uh, regarding the performance, uh, and the scaling issues in Grails framework. Do you do you do you see any 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 kind of uh, scaling issues, uh, like building a building an application like deals 2 bycom or maybe a best buycom having a million customers um, browsing the sites in a day? In in Gaelic. Not in getting plain uh, Grails framework. Oh, Grails, Grails. Um, yeah, I mean, that's going to have the same kind of scaling issues as any web application. Uh, Grails, Grails shouldn't be causing any of those headaches, uh, but anything can go wrong there scaling-wise, right? I mean, you can have uh, the database layer usually is where that goes wrong, and there are certainly things you can do in Grails that are not performant. I don't think there's anything inherent about Grails that would make it a bad candidate for that. Uh, but that's the most I could say in general. You know, the rest of it would be so specific. what would be the use cases, uh, maybe in the real life uh, scenarios, um, while considering Grails framework? And what, what, should be not, what should not be the use cases for the Grails? Um, well, if you want to talk about Grails, let me, uh, let me, let's talk after separately. Um, in terms of Gaelic, uh, I would say use cases would be small and simple. And even if you think it's going to be big eventually, if you can start it small and simple, you can do it in Gaelic. But if it's big and complicated, you know it's big and complicated, don't go there. It's just going to be a, a pain. Thanks. You bet. But see me afterward, and we'll talk about Grails. Anyone else? I'm turning off the microphone. All right, come see me if you want to talk. Thanks for being here.